Do you know, I have a friend who told me that he thinks that diabetes is not fatal. I said, what, really? Well, they don't call it liver beaties. <laughs> and the other day I was on a diabetes awareness website. And then a pop-up came up and asked me if I accept cookies. Is that a trick question? <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Ryan here again. I'm quite excited about today's video. We're talking about the approach to clinical examination in endocrinology. Hope you and your family are well. This is the outline of our discussion today. We're going to be starting off with a handy clinical case. Then we're going to be talking about how to elicit a history pertinent to the endocrinological system. Let me look at um, clinical examination in endocrinology and we're going to offer differentials for all the clinical features we're going to be discussing. Uh, then we're going to just have a bird's eye view of the different investigative modalities available to us in the discipline of endocrinology. And of course, we're going to close with encouragement from scripture and my references. Are you ready? Are you steady? Fasten your seatbelts. Okay. So uh, let's get going. Let's just get my handy pointer in here. Uh, righty, there we go. So Mr. Livid is admitted to hospital after a car accident. His medical history is unknown and on presentation he is obtunded and can provide no history whatsoever. CT scan reveals a splenic laceration and he is emergently taken to the operating room for splenectomy, which proceeds without complications. So at completion of the operation, all bleeding has stopped and he returns to the intensive care unit. However, he remains deeply hypotensive, uh oh, with a blood pressure of 70 over 50, uh, with an increase to only 82 of the two millimeters mercury after a bolus of two liters of normal saline intravenously. He is afebrile with an abnormal white cell count. Repeat CT scanning of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis shows no hemorrhage. The jugular venous pressure is not visible above the clavicle. He has a round face and is obese. Uh, you note the following features on physical examination. Right, so let me just move this so you can have a look. He has all these clinical findings. Looks uh, sneakily suspicious, doesn't it? <laughs> so, what is the next step in his management? Uh oh, sorry. Is it A, return to the operating room for exploratory lab? B, administer hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV? C, administer vancomycin and then tazosin thereafter? D, insert an intraiotic balloon pump for contrapulsation? Or is it E, perform MRI of the spine? Mm hmm, I wonder. Let's get started, guys. History taking in endocrinology. So, as is always the case, this is my handy history taking template. And if you've watched my videos before, you are very familiar with this template. It helps salt make food good food, so tantalizing the chai chai. And uh, we're going to hone into the systemic inquiry as it relates to the endocrine system. All right, so major symptoms to elicit in the endocrine history. There's a whole truckload of systems of symptoms rather. Let's get going. So appetite and weight change, especially in the setting of diabetes and thyroid disease, disturbed defecation, sweating, change in hair distribution, skin changes, lethargy, pigmentation, change in uh, stature, loss of libido and erectile dysfunction. Talk about the menses, whether it's extremely heavy or light, how many pads you use per day, etc. Looking at menorrhagia and uh, polymenorrhea. Okay, a polyuria and a lump in the neck speaking to greater. Now, honing into specific endocrine abnormalities and typical signs and symptoms. So, uh, in terms of hypopituitarism, right, we're going to inquire of each of the hormones that come from the anterior and the posterior pituitary. So, in good order, ACTH deficiency, if it's chronic, it'll manifest with uh, symptomatology as for Addison's disease with one exception that there's no excessive pigmentation, right, in the chronic form. In the acute form of ACTS deficiency, what you have is fatigue, hypotension, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. If there's thyroid stimulating hormone deficiency, the symptoms are exactly as the same as you would expect in the setting of hypothyroidism, right? <clears throat> if there's gonadotropin deficiency in women, this will manifest infertility, osteoporosis, because remember that estrogen maintains the structural integrity of your bone. That is why a lot of postmenopausal females are actually at risk for osteoporosis, right? Secondary amenorrhea. In men, gonadotropin deficiency manifests with testicular atrophy, infertility, and a uh, diminished body hair, male pattern body hair. If you have prolactin deficiency, this will manifest with failure of lactation for women uh, post parturition. <clears throat> Growth hormone deficiency just generally gives rise to a loss of a muscle mass. Increased fat, because remember that growth hormone is lipolytic. 
So without growth hormone, you end up with increased fat, especially in the centripetal distribution, increased cardiovascular risk, and asthenia. Vasopressin comes from the posterior pituitary, otherwise more affectionately termed antidiuretic hormone. And if you have a deficiency of this, right, you can have what we call diabetes insipidus with polyuria, increased thirst, dilute urine, hypernatremia, and nocturia. Diatoxicosis, we know these patients, and we'll look at uh, a handy uh, example later. These patients often have preference for cooler weather. They have weight loss despite increased appetite, which is called hyperphagia. They complain of palpitations, especially at rest, increased sweating or diaphoresis, nervousness, irritability, diarrhea, amenorrhea, muscle weakness, existential dyspnea, and tremor. Hypothyroidism, or patients who have mixed edema, have a preference for warmer weather. They often complain of lethargy, the swelling of the eyelids, which is edema, and often what we call mixed edema because of mucopolysaccharides accumulating in the skin. They complain of a hoarse voice, <laughs> constipation, coarse skin, hyperkeratinemia. So remember, a differential for jaundice is hyperkeratinemia, but the big difference is that hyperkeratinemia will not affect the sclera. It just affects the skin. And the other place to look for jaundice is in the undersurface of the tongue. Uh, and hyperkeratinemia does not give you uh, jaundice there. Also, we have the so-called hung reflexes, the delayed relaxation phase of your tendon reflexes, best elicited at the Achilles reflex. No reference to Troy. Okay, diabetes mellitus, as we talk about, these patients often complain of polyuria, polydipsia, thirst, blood, vision, weakness, infections, especially fungal infections, itching of the groin, everybody knows that story, rash with pruritus, valvae, and paranitis, weight loss, tiredness, lethargy, and disturbance of the conscious state. Hypoglycemia, these patients often complain of morning headaches with weight gain, seizures, and sweating. Alrighty. Primary adrenal insufficiency, often these patients have pigmentation, we'll see a couple of examples later on, fatigue, loss of weight, anorexia, nausea, diarrhea, nocturia, postural hypotension, mental changes and seizures. Acromegaly has a whole truckload of symptoms, right? Fatigue, weakness, increased sweating, heat intolerance, weight gain, enlarging hands and feet. So their rings don't fit them anymore, their hats don't fit them anymore, enlarged and coarsened facial features, uh, Often with prognathism, we'll see an example later on headaches, uh, often because of mass effect of this pituitary mass which is enlarging, decreased vision, so field cuts, especially bitemporal hemianopia, deepening of the voice, decreased libido erectile dysfunction. Cushing syndrome, they complain of uh, trunkal obesity, purple stria, which are livid in more than one centimeter in diameter. They have moon like faces, facial, facial plethora, buffalo hump, myopathy, so complaining of weakness, especially proximal pattern weakness. They dog, I have difficulty waking up from a seated position. Dog, I have difficulty hanging up clothes or reaching up to fit something from a high shaft. It's weakness of the pectoral and the pelvic girdle muscles. They often have immunoparesis and have recurrent infections and bruising. That was a mouthful. All right, guys, let's hop straight into examination in endocrinology, right? First up, you just want to inspect the patient, Get go to the bed, the, the, the leg end of the bed, make a gentle inspection, and inspect for one of the diagnostic faces or body, body habituses. I'm not even sure if uh, habituses is an English word. Maybe it's one habitus, two habiti. What you know what I mean, right? So if on inspection the diagnosis is not obvious, you're going to proceed with the following examination, right? So pick up the hands, look at the overall size. If it's quite large and fleshy, you're thinking about acromegaly. Look at the length of the metacarpals, right? Because you're looking here for pseudo-hypoparathroidism uh, and pseudo pseudo hypoparathroidism with the shortening of the fourth and fifth metacarpals. Look at any abnormalities of the nails. With hypothyroidism, you may have plumber's nails. You may have thyrocropochy. Or changes on hypothyroidism and hypoparathyroidism. Check for the tremor, which happens, right? Uh, the differential, of course, is hyperthyroidism or anxiety neurosis, right? Palmer erythema, sweating of the palms, speaking to hyperthyroidism. So this is a bird's eye view of the endocrine features, generally, that we can try and elicit. Okay, so we're just going to cover this uh, in good order. So general observation, demeanor, mental status, if the patient is agitated, that may point or speak to hypothyroidism. If the patient just has a slow meditation, speaks to hypothyroidism. Look at the appearance of the essential obesity in Cushing's pallor, hair distribution. Look for absent axillary or male pattern a distribution of hair or pubic hair, which speaks to hypopituitism. Look for vertigo and hirsutism. In the hands, you want to note for any skin crease pigmentation, speaking to Addison's disease. Also, in the back of your goes, ah. 
right? Uh, large, sweaty, fleshy hands speaks to acromegaly. A tremor speaks to hyperthyroidism. Check for carpal tunnel syndrome and palmar erythema. Then go up and check the pulse and blood pressure. Often with hyperthyroidism, you have atrial fibrillation, tachycardia, right? You may have hypertension in the setting of Cushing's and Kahn syndrome, right? And postural hypotension with Addison's disease. Don't miss postural hypotension, please. In the eyes, looking for the eye changes of thyroid disease and the way of exothelma, sophthalmoplegia. There could be a visual field defect, all right? Uh, in the face, you have features of Cushing syndrome, Addison's disease, acromegaly, all right? Um, in the neck, we have goiter, which could be smooth or nodular. In the breast, you look for galacteria, gynecomastia. Uh, osteoporosis is the name of the game in hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome, and hypokinetism. Also, you want to look for loss of height and thoracic kyphosis. Genitals, of course, you want to check for vitalization, pubertal development, testicular volume of the legs. For proximal myopathy, like we said, pretubular myxedema, necrobosis, lipoidica, diabetic quorum, which speaks to usually type 1 diabetes mellitus. Check the height and the weight and the body mass in the exterior analysis and check for any psychological or psychiatric assessment knowing that steroids can cause psychosis. All right, the principal endocrine glands are shown here. So on the top, we have the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The pituitary is the master endocrine gland. It has the anterior portion and the posterior portion. Then going to the neck, we have the thyroids. And of course, at the four poles, we have four beautiful parathyroid glands. Then we have the adrenals, right? And the adrenals are divided into three sections, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis. And the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. Salt, sugar, sex. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the pancreas, the ovaries, and the testes. Those are your principal endocrine glands, everybody. And looking at common clinical features in certain endocrine diseases. So weight gain probably speaks to hypo. Thyroidism, PCOS, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, Cushing's, weight loss we have in the setting of hyperthyroidism and diabetes mellitus as well as adrenal insufficiency. Short stature often can be constitutional or could be due to non-endocrine systemic disease like celiac disease, chronic renal failure, cyanotic congenital heart disease, the list goes on, growth hormone deficiency as well. Delayed puberty could be constitutional or could be due to non-endocrine systemic disease, hypothyroidism, hypopit, primary gonadal failure. Menstrual disturbance happens in the setting of PCOS, hypoplastinemia, thyroid dysfunction. Diffused neck swelling can be attributed to simple goiter, graves, or Hashimoto's. Excessive thirst happens with diabetes mellitus or diabetes insipidus, hyperparathyroidism, and Kwan syndrome. Hocidism often may have, it can be an idiopathic flavor or it could be due to PCOS, Cushing syndrome, or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So-called funny turns or seizures can be due to hypoglycemia, but you also have it with FAO or a neuroendocrine tumor. Diaphoresis and sweating happens in the setting of hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, acromegaly, and FAO. Flushing is typical for carcinoid syndrome together with hypogonadism, especially during menopause when you have these so-called hot flashes. Resistant hypertension, the common culprits from an endocrine perspective. Kwan syndrome, Cushing syndrome, FAO, acromegaly, don't forget about renal artery stenosis, right? Erectile dysfunction happens if you have primary or secondary hypogonadism, diabetes mellitus, it's a common, common manifestation of autonomic neuropathy, non-endocrine systemic disease, medication induced in the way of beta blockers and opiates, muscle weakness, remember, it's often proximal muscle weakness, so like we said, pictures on pelvic girdle, weakness, right, and that happens in the setting of Cushing syndrome, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, osteomalacia. Bone fragility and fractures happens with hypogonadism, hyperthyroidism, and Cushing syndrome, and altered facial appearance, of course, with hypothyroidism, Cushing's, acromegaly, PCOS. Okay, guys, we have to, have to, have to speak about the metabolic syndrome. It is a problem plaguing society today as we know it, right? So we require three out of five for the diagnosis as per the World Health Organization and the International Diabetes Federation criteria. Let's look at this nicely. So blood pressure, the diagnostic criteria is systolic above 130 mils mercury uh, uh, with a diastolic above 85 mils mercury or the patient's currently on treatment for hypertension, right? Waist circumference in men above 102 centimeters, in women above 89 centimeters. But if you are of Asian descent, then it becomes even more strict with a waist circumference of above 80 centimeters if you're female or 92 centimeters if you are male. The third criteria is fasting triglycerides above 1.7 millimol per liter or you are already being treated with statins. The fourth one is, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Triggs. If your triggers are high, you look for treatment with fibrates, right? HDL cholesterol in men, uh, if it's less than one, 
and in women less than 1.3 because remember HDL cholesterol is the good cholesterol it's the desirable cholesterol you want to have increased levels of that however in men if you got a value below 1 millimol per liter and in women below 1.3 millimol per liter that's a problem and of course your fasting glucose if it's above 5.6 millimol per liter or if you're on treatment for diabetes mellitus so three out of the five makes a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome right guys getting back to the basics Continuing with our examination approach, right? You want to take the pulse, and of course, there could be atrial fibrillation or tachycardia in a setting of hyperthyroidism, right? Take the blood pressure, you expect hypertension in Cushing syndrome and in Kahn syndrome, which is primary aldosteronism. Postural hypertension in Addison's disease, don't miss that. Look for Trousseau's sign, right? Which is a sign of tetany that you get in hypocalcemia, right? What you do is you inflate the blood pressure cuff to above systolic and you leave it there for a few minutes, and you see the typical posture of the hand, the so called obstetrician's hand. The accouchier's hand, right? And that speaks to um, uh, tetany, right? That goes together with Schwarzstick sign, right? Which is tapping over the facial nerve will cause twitching of the facial muscle, all right? Uh, testing for proximal muscle weakness, right? So that speaks to thyroid disease and Cushing syndrome. Go to the axilla, look for a, a loss of axillary hair, which speaks to hypopituitarism, and any acanthosis, nigricans, and skin tags, which happen with acromegaly, which, happen, which actually happen with the insulin resistance. So any condition which gives you insulin resistance, especially diabetes mellitus, but also acromegaly, Cushing's, and so forth, right? Examine the eyes, looking for the typical changes of hypothyroidism. You get the stare. Right, proptosis, you get exothamos, you get lid retraction, lid lag, uh, the patient complains of retro orbital pain or gaze evoked pain, you have conjunctival swelling, swelling of the caruncle, conjunctival injection, and if it progresses, it gets worse and worse until you actually have sight loss. Okay, in the fundi, you want to look for the typical diabetic changes. So, you know, we have pre-proliferative, we have proliferative, we have maculopathy, and then we eventually have blindness and retinal detachment, vitreal hemorrhage. Right, check for the face, you want to look for hirsutism. Look for fine wrinkled hairless skin, which may point to hypopituitarism. Note any skin greasiness, acne, or plethora, which speaks to Cushing syndrome. Right? Also, increased skin greasiness also speaks to acromegaly as well. Look into the mouth and look for protrusion of the chin and enlargement of the tongue, which happens with acromegaly. The buccal mucosa, if you see uh, irritation or hair, that speaks to Addison's disease. Alrighty. Examine the neck for thyroid enlargement. I'm going to be doing a completely separate video talking about uh, examination of the thyroid. So watch out for that one. Any webbing of the neck speaks to Turner's syndrome. Prepare for those supraclavicular dorsus, cervical fat pads, speaking to Cushing syndrome. Inspect the chest wall. We're looking for hirsutism or loss of body hair. Reduction in the breast size in women speaks to pan hypopituitarism. Gynecomastia in men. Uh, nipple pigmentation also happens or may happen in the setting of Addison's disease. Then you want to examine the abdomen. We're looking in Cushing syndrome for those beautiful, livid purple stria, more than one centimeter diameter, right? Central fat deposition, so called limb on a stick appearance, hirsutism, all speak to Cushing syndrome. And look for evidence of virilization or atrophy in the external genitalia, right? Inspect the legs for diabetic changes, as we know there's a whole host of those. We've done a video on the diabetic foot. I encourage you to go back and to review that. Measure the body weight and the, the stature, examine the urine, okay? Alrighty, 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 let's talk thyroid. Right, so on the left of the diagram, right, we have hypothyroidism and then, yeah, we have hypothyroidism on the other side. So, alright, in hypothyroidism, the cardinal features are exophthalmos, ophthalmoplegia, but we spoke about eye disease in Graves, right? You may have a goiter, especially with the Bruy in Graves disease. Watch out for tachycardia, angina, and atrial fibrillation, systolic hypertension, oligomenorrhea. So remember, in, in hypothyroidism, you have less frequent menses. But you have diarrhea, sweaty, tremulous, and warm hands, proximal myopathy, pretermal myxedema and grave disease, ankle swelling, and heart failure. And look how thin and how pale this lady is. Now, I think it's a lady. <laughs> but anyway, the general uh, signs you look for is weight loss despite increased appetite, heat intolerance, that's a symptom, anxiety, irritability, and a fast, fine tremor. Now, contrast this to the situation of hypothyroidism. Uh, on the other side of the figure, right, we often have periorbital edema, a husky voice, <coughs> whoops, goiter, bradycardia, carpal tunnel syndrome, mineralgia, so more heavy menses, and constipation, right, you can't get that stool out, man, and in general, 
We have a lower metabolic rate, weight gain, sensitivity to cold, lethargy, mental impairment, and depression. All right. So these are some nice pictures from uh, McLeod's showing us, right, that uh, we have the typical faces of someone who has graves. Now you can see the obvious uh, exophthalmos, so we can see the sclera, which is obvious there. All right, here we have severe inflammatory thyroid disease with constitutive injection. Um, in picture C, we see thyroid acropoche, which is a fancy way of saying clubbing and setting of thyroid disease. Right, and here we have pretibial, mixed edema. Okay, here we're looking at goiter, right, different kinds of goiter. So this A and B shows a diffuse goiter. This is um, obviously different views, the lateral view in picture B and an anterior view in picture A, showing a beautiful diffuse goiter. C, we see a unilateral on uninodular toxic nodule here we see a marginodular goiter in picture d all right let's just move this into the other side this is the typical appearance of someone who has hypothyroidism before treatment so you can see the facial plethora you can see the kind of um it's not nice but they say it's a toad like faces and you can see that right you can see a loss of the outer a third of the eyebrows um and see, on treatment, she looks so much better uh, after levothyroxine treatment, okay? Uh, there's some more images here. Let's just move this out of the way so we can appreciate this. This is parathyroid disease. So A speaks to a brown tumor. You can see this swelling of the middle phalanx, and this happens in hyperparathyroidism. Right here, we can see a corneal calcification, right, in hyperparathyroidism, right? Picture C shows us pseudo hyperparathyroidism with the shortened uh, metacarpals, especially the shortened fourth and fifth metacarpals. You can appreciate that, right? And D, these are best even the patient makes a fist. Okay, nice one. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about causes of uh, thyrotoxicosis and hypothyroidism. So, causes of thyrotoxicosis, let's just get my pin in there. Cause of thyrotoxicosis can be primary or secondary. But the primary causes are Graves' disease, right? Toxic marginal goiter. You can have a toxic adenoma, harsh immortal thyroiditis early in its cause. Later, it, of course, produces hypothyroidism. So, this, that's the natural progression or the cause of Hashimoto's, right? Subacute thyroiditis, which is transient, postpartum thyroiditis, which is non tender. Then we've got the infamous John Bastar phenomenon, which is iodine induced. When you're giving iodine after a previously deficient diet, and that can actually cause hyperfunction and hyperthyroidism. Secondary causes of thyrotoxicosis has to do with something with the pituitary. So it's TSH that's the problem, not T4 or T3, it's TSH. So pituitary causes very rare with this TSH hypersecretion. Hydatiform mole or choriocarcinoma, uh, HCG secretion, very rare. Stroma ovari, very rare. Drugs like excessive thyroid hormone ingestion or amiodrome. Causes of hypothyroidism as well can be primary, can be secondary, can be tertiary, can be transient. So primary refers to it causation without a goiter or with a goiter. So without a goiter, primary hypothyroidism, we speak to decrease or absent thyroid tissue, especially in the setting of idiopathic uh, idiopathic atrophy or treatment with thyrotoxicosis of thyrotoxicosis with radio iodine ablation or surgery they can become hypothyroid right if you have agenesis or a lingual thyroid or unresponsiveness to csh if you have primary hypothyroidism with a goiter it speaks to decreased thyroid hormone synthesis and happens in the setting of chronic autoimmune diseases the poster child for that is hashimoto's hashimoto Drugs like lithium and amiodarone, inborn errors like enzyme deficiencies and endemic iodine deficiency. But remember, iodine deficiency nowadays is very rare because table salt is iodinated. All right, could be a secondary lesion with the problems with TSH, not with T4 or T3. That speaks to a pituitary lesion. Can be a tertiary lesion, but there's something wrong with TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus. It could be a transient phenomenon, uh, right? And that happens usually with subacute thyroiditis, postpartum, and post subtotal thyroidectomy. Okay. One of the neurological associations of hypothyroidism, there's a whole bucket load of them, right? But I just want to draw attention to some of them. So, commonly we get entrapment, right? Uh, the, the classic example there is carpal tunnel and tarsal tunnel syndrome. So, you're going to do your um, Fallon test, you try and listen to your Tinel sign, look for those delayed ankle jerks, especially uh, uh, affecting the Achilles and muscle cramps. And uncommon um, phenomenology here uh, include peripheral neuropathy, proximal myopathy, hypokalemic periodic paralysis, cerebellar syndrome. Uh, yes, when we spoke about the cerebellar exam, we said hypothyroidism was one of the differentials for cerebellar signs, psychosis, coma, unmasking of myasthenia gravis, right? Uh, cerebrovascular disease, high CSF protein, nerve deafness. 
Alrighty, and here's a beautiful picture taken from Tally showing us the so-called hung-up reflexes of hypothyroidism. You want to look for rapid dose reflection followed by slow plant reflection after the tendon is tapped. Thank you to makecomic.com which shows us the men syndromes. This is just a fun diagram here. So we know there's men 1 and men 2A and 2B, right? Men 1 is called Wormer syndrome. That often encompasses pituitary adenoma together with parathyroid tumor and pancreatic tumor, the three Ps. And those pancreatic tumors can be insulinomas, gastrinomas, etc. Men 2A is otherwise affectionately called simple syndrome. And here we have hyperparathyroidism, medullary thyroid cancer, and FAO. Men 2B has to do with medullary thyroid cancer, mucosal neuromas, marfanoid habitus, intestinal ganglioneuromas, and FAO. Okay, let's talk about hypopituitarism for a bit. So hypopituitarism can be caused by many things, but most often due to a space-occupying lesion, right, which is a big old pituitary tumor, which can be secretory or non-secretory, or we call them functional or non-functional, depending on whether or not they are producing those hormones. Other tumors can also cause mass effect, like craniopharyngioma, metastatic carcinoma, granulomatous disease, setting off uh, sarcoid, and TB, 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 and more TB, iatrogenic issues in the way of surgery or irradiation, Post head trauma, she hand syndrome. What on earth is she hand syndrome? That speaks to postpartum pituitary hemorrhage resulting in necrosis of the gland, especially if there's com complication at the time of birth and you have ischemia to the pituitary gland, right? And that manifests first by a failure of lactation postpartum. You should always ring alarm bells that maybe the patient has she hand syndrome. Empty cell syndrome often is an incidental MRI scan finding and not always associated with insufficiency of the pituitary gland. What about pituitary apoplexy and infarction? And the tip off there is a worsening headache. Uh, idiopathic uh, causes of hypoput and drug related, especially monoclonal antibodies to immune regulators. This is a picture of a gentleman who has hypopituitarism and note uh, his hairless uh, skin, very smooth skin, absence of secondary sexual characteristics, absence of axillary hair. Alrighty. So here are we looking at diabetes and the skin. So what do we look out for? Remember that the common complications of diabetes are becoming two flavors, microvascular and macrovascular. So macrovascular has to do with trans-ischemic attacks or stroke, so cerebrovascular accidents. It has to do with myocardial ischemia and infarction. And of course, peripheral vascular disease in the way of claudication, ganglion, amputation. Right, microvascular sequelae have to do with diabetic retinopathy, impaired vision and cataract, diabetic nephropathy. Remember, the leading cause of chronic kidney disease worldwide is drum roll, please. Drrr, ding, diabetic nephropathy. Right, so that will manifest with protein loss and renal failure. Neuropathy, there's various manifestations of diabetic neuropathy. We divide them into autonomic and somatic. In autonomic, there's postural hypotension, gastroparesis, diarrhea, acidic bladder, erectile dysfunction, and a whole host of others. But those are the most common. From the somatic standpoint, we have peripheral neuropathy, which manifests with sensory loss, motor weakness, and the proverbial diabetic foot. Don't forget that diabetes causes immunoparesis and predisposes to infections, all right? This is now a fun representation of acromegaly and gigantism, typical of uh, these conditions, courtesy of midcomic.com. Thank you so much, guys. So in acromegaly, this, like we see, is a disorder of insulin-like growth factor 1, which causes excessive growth of the hands, feet, jaw, and internal organs in adulthood, right? The MRIs can show a big old pituitary tumor in 90% of acromegaly patients. And the best confirmatory test for acromegaly is the oral glucose suppression test. And you find they have difficulty suppressing the glucose, right? Um, so normally glucose is going to suppress the growth hormone. But in acromegaly, that doesn't happen, right? Gigantism refers to abnormal uh, abnormally high linear growth due to excessive uh, action of IGF-1 before the closure of the epiphyseal plate in childhood, right? So acromegaly happens in adults, but gigantism happens from the time uh, the patient is young. Alrighty. So here is typical features of acromegaly. You can see the typical facies, uh, the um, coarse facial features, the prognathism, all right? And typically here is separation of the lower teeth. So often these patients are referred to endocrinology by, amazingly, dentists and anesthetists who actually pick up on the fact that the patient has prognathism and has separation of the lower teeth with underbite. Okay, uh, picture C shows us the large fleshy hands, typical of acromegaly, and D, the widening of the feet. Alrighty, and increased heel pair thickness, which you will see inevitably with uh, imaging. 
Okay, so the common signs we have here, transfrontal scar, which may indicate previous pituitary surgery, frontal bossing. The typical visual field cut is bitemporal hemianopia. But when you do um, phonoscopy, you're going to see papilla edema, android streaks. When you look at the jaw, there's prognathism, there's an underbite, there's widely spaced teeth, especially in the lower jaw and enlarged tongue. So macroglossia, you have molluscum fibrosum, proximal myopathy, spade like hands, okay? Excuse me. So let's now talk about causes of adrenal insufficiency. So it can be split into chronic and acute flavors, and chronic is divided into primary and secondary. So causes of primary chronic addisons or adrenal insufficiency is autoimmune adrenal disease. And remember, these autoimmune conditions often keep company and they stick together in one family. They are what we call the autoimmune polyglandular syndromes. We'll talk about that later. But infection in the way of TB and HIV, can lomatous conditions like sarcoidosis and TB, following heparin therapy, all right, malignant infiltration, hemochromatosis, and adrenal leukodystrophy. Right? Uh, secondly, and don't forget the infamous waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome, which happens in the setting of overwhelming meningococcal septicemia, which then causes infarction of your beloved adrenal gland. Secondary causes of chronic adrenal insufficiency has to do with pituitary or hypothalamic disease. The problem there is not with the adrenal itself, but upstream in the pituitary or the hypothalamus. Acute causes of adrenal insufficiency is septicemia, right? So, sorry, I beg your pardon. Meningococcal septicemia, what asphyxiation syndrome happens in the acute flavor or acute form of adrenal insufficiency, post adrenalectomy, and basically any stress in a patient with chronic hypoadrenalism or abrupt cessation of prolonged high dose steroid therapy. Here's a beautiful example of uh, palm crease pigmentation in the patient who has Addison's. This is vitiligo involving the fingers, and like we said, all the autoimmune diseases tend to stick together. Vitiligo is one of them. So this is Cushing syndrome, and we can appreciate the Cushing right facies, the facial rubor, <clears throat> or the facial plethora that we see. These patients often have the so-called lemon on a stick appearance with a livid abdominal stria, the dorsal cervical fat pad. And picture B is after she had curative um, pituitary surgery. So picture A and B are the same patient before and after curative surgery. What a remarkable difference. In picture D, we see that the typical thin skin um, purpura caused by wristwatch pressure and the place to check is on the dorsal aspect of the middle phalanx of the second finger of the non-dominant hand. That is where you want to check typically for thinness of the skin. Causes of Cushing syndrome most often is due to exogenous administration of excess steroids probably secondary or you're trying to treat some other condition like chronic asthma or some rheumatological condition where you're giving steroids, even ITP is a common indication in our setting. Or it could be due to adrenal hyperplasia, which is either secondary to pituitary ACTH production, Cushing disease, which is most common, uh, that can be caused by a microadenoma, a macroadenoma, or pituitary hypothalamic dysfunction. Or it could be secondary to an adenocorticotropic releasing hormone producing tumor. Example, a small cell lung cancer. So something from outside the pituitary which is producing ACTH or it can be due to a problem within the adrenal gland itself the adrenal neoplasia and we have adenoma or carcinoma but adrenal carcinoma is very very rare here's an example of Addison's disease so we can see the typical facial pigmentation here and pigmentation of the buccal mucosa right and B we can appreciate that even more the buccal uh, pigmentation C shows our skin crease pigmentation and D once again vitiligo uh, striking due to uh, the Addisonian pigmentation of the so-called normal skin. Alrighty, and this is carcinoid syndrome, the typical acute carcinoid flush with chronic telangiectasia, and these patients often have bouts of diarrhea as well. Okay, guys, we're closing up shortly, but we just want to look quickly at investigations which we can do in endocrine disease, right? So at the bedside, you can do urinalysis. So glycosidia obviously speaks to diabetes mellitus. Proteinuria can happen in hypertensive renal damage and in diabetic nephrosclerosis as well. Do your capillary blood glucose, which is high in diabetes. In terms of your hematological investigations, the calcium, as you know, is high in hyperparathyroidism. You do your free T4, which is high in hypothyroidism and low in hypothyroidism. TSH, which is often undetectable in hypothyroidism, and it is high in primary hypothyroidism, which makes sense because the TSH wants to stimulate that thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone in hypothyroidism, right? Serum cortisol is going to be low in hypoadrenalism, usually with a reduced synactin response. There's loss of the diurnal rhythm in Cushing's and reduced dexamethasone suppressibility in Cushing's, right? 
Gonadotropins are going to be high in primary hypogonadism in both males and females. Imaging available to us, ultrasound for thyroid, parathyroid, ovary, and testes can be done if you suspect pathology in any of those organs. MRI of the pituitary and the pancreas, CT of the, of the pancreas and the adrenals, uh, radionucleotide scans that are offered by nuclear medicine for the thyroid, or parathyroid, uh, adrenals, and neuroendocrine tumors, and PET scan. By PET, I don't mean cat or dog now. I mean positron emission tomography, which is available for thyroid and neuroendocrine tumors. Then other invasive tests we can do, if you're thinking about a thyroid nodule, you can do a fine needle aspiration as emphasitology. If it's ACTH depending pushings that you want to try and prove, you want to do inferior petrosal sinus sampling for an adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone tumor. All right. So as promised earlier, we spoke about the autoimmune polyendocrine syndromes, and here they are. Voila. Right, type 1 and type 2. So type 1 is rare autosomal recessive. It uh, has three main um, elements, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism, and Addison's, all right? But type 2 is probably, by and large, the more common of the two uh, flavors, right? It consists of these features, insulin requiring type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease, Addison's disease, myasthenia gravis, pernicious anemia, primary gonadal failure. Okay. And these are essentials given to us from Talia and O'Connor regarding the endocrine exam. I thought we could just touch on this. It says that the endocrine examination is usually targeted at the uh, likely endocrine disease suggested by the history. So as we know, examination just serves to confirm what you have elicited by the history, right? They go hand in hand. The pituitary gland can cause endocrine disease anywhere in the body, but headache, 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 and visual loss are important abnormalities caused by local mass effects in the brain substance itself. Some endocrine conditions present as so-called spot diagnoses, and this you can spot a mile away, the likes of acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, Addison's disease. Always be on the lookout for subtle abnormalities of facial appearance or body habitus that may suggest endocrine disease. If you do not actually think about this in the first few seconds of general inspection, you will probably miss these abnormalities, all right? Guys, coming back to our clinical case, so we had Mr. Livid who was involved in a car accident, he underwent splenectomy and then he was hypotensive post-op, he went to ICU, the blood pressure hardly responded to two liters of normal saline, but he also had these features, he had livid abdominal stria, all right, what's going on, what's the next step, I wonder, you want to give him hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IVI. So this patient is obese and has abdominal stria and the moon faces are suggestive of glucocorticoid excess. And often this is due to exogenous corticosteroid administration, although it may well be due to endogenous production as well, which implies that he may have Cushing syndrome. Now, any physiological stress such as trauma and infection, and he just had major surgery and he had an accident, would trigger an adrenal crisis, so he needs hydrocortisone, and that's going to sort him out. Okay, I just want to spend a few moments, my friends, talking about scripture. Today we're talking about foolishness. Oh dear. The book of Proverbs chapter 12 verse 18 says, There is one whose rash words, now rash not in the way of a skin problem, but rash as an impulsive, whose impulsive words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The book of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. The Bible also says that too much talk leads to sin. Therefore, we should be sensible and keep our mouths shut. I pray that we will use wisdom in our association and communication with people, not seek to be impulsive in our speech, but we will always seek to understand what is going on and be quick to listen, slow to speak, and always slow to become angry. All right, here's my references, and God bless you. Thanks for uh, watching this video. Thanks for liking and sharing and subscribing to my channel. And I'll see you again soon with another helpful clinical video on algorithms and mnemonics in internal medicine. God bless you.